Hi everyone and welcome to the Be Ready for the World conference. We're on day two now. If you joined us yesterday, I hope you enjoyed your sessions. I'm Emma, I'm from Cambridge University Press and I'll be hosting this session for you this morning. I am thrilled to be joined by Jonathan Ellums today. Um, Jonathan's held a number of senior roles in education. He is currently Director of Standards and Director of International Education at the Cambridge Academic Partnership. Jonathan's going to be sharing his expertise um, in getting parents involved and engaged in the education process and, and how you might approach that. As we're going along, I just want to share a few points with you just before I hand over to Jonathan. You may notice that your mics are muted and your cameras are off. This is because we've got quite a large number of, of people joining us today and we want to minimise any background noise. If you do have any questions, please do raise those in the Q&A box, um, which you can find at the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions, please don't post them in the chat because we, we may lose them and not be able to get to them. If you get any issues with sound or with lag on the slides, um, please don't worry. Do just drop a note in the chat and we'll do our best to help you. We are also recording these sessions and we'll be sharing the recordings with you at the end. Um, you'll receive an email from us at the end of this week with a link to a playlist where you can access all of the sessions um, on YouTube. We do suggest to um, get the best sound quality that you use headphones. So if you are experiencing some sound issues, um, please do pop headphones in first and see if that solves it. Uh, we've had a number of questions about certificates in previous sessions. Um, just to confirm, we aren't unfortunately available um, able to provide certificates for these sessions. So that's it from me. Without further ado, I will hand over to Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan. Morning, everybody. I say good morning, assuming it is morning wherever you are. Um, so that's me, essentially. Um, you've already heard that in the introduction. Um, I am, for your information, sitting in a relatively sunny uh, Cambridge myself um, in my office here in one of the schools within the group. Uh, and today we're going to uh, explore ways um, that schools can engage families. Now, um, the vast majority of teachers, and I like to think all teachers enter the teaching profession um, because they have a kind of heartfelt belief that they want to improve the lives of young people. Um, from whatever background uh, they start their life from. Um, and this mission kind of unites all teachers around the world. Um, despite this, it's still true uh, that the, the poorest students are much less likely than the wealthier uh, classmates that they have to leave school with the qualifications that they want or need. It's a sad fact, but it is um, a fact. Now, whilst much of the battle to close that gap uh, can be won in the classroom, what happens at home um, is crucial. Uh, and schools and parents really should work in partnership with that shared interest into, in terms of doing the best uh, for the children in their care. Um, but it can be very difficult to know where to start. Uh, some parents feel very anxious uh, about reading to their children, for example, uh, particularly if they struggle themselves with their own literacy skills. Some might struggle in terms of organisation, in terms of uh, mathematics, so on and so forth. Um, some people just feel that they don't have the subject knowledge. Now, here in Cambridge, uh, we're very lucky that some of our schools uh, have, a, have a catchment, have families, where um, the family group are, are very well educated and can help children. But we also have schools in, in, in very poor parts of Cambridgeshire where that isn't necessarily um, the case. OK, so um, I want you to think about where you are at the moment um, in terms of a, a mission statement. Now, even if you don't have a written mission statement, what is the mission statement that you as a school, as a, as a senior leader, if you are a senior leader, or a middle leader have in your head when it comes to engaging families, okay? Um, as, as we probably all know, uh, we can all write mission statements that contain all the right kind of language uh, and sound as though they're going to do the right thing, but are we, are we necessarily realizing what it is that we've written down? What kind of uh, vision do we have? What mission do we have? What is our goal in terms of working with students? Now, the next uh, three slides show actual uh, mission statements uh, from uh, schools from around the world, from school groups from around the world, um, in terms of what they want to do to engage families. Um, I shan't read them all to you because uh, you can see the slides. 
Uh, but if you just take a moment to read this, I've, I've emboldened uh, what I think to be key. They're talking about increasing the active participation, uh, communication, collaboration between parents and schools um, so that they gain in terms of student achievement. So this, this mission statement here is very much about families and schools working together to improve uh, achievement. And for that, I read great outcomes. Just giving you a moment to read. Okay, here we're talking about providing families with learning opportunities uh, and resources to enable uh, families uh, to be involved in their children's educational success. Educational success is more of a an all-encompassing kind of uh, statement. Are we talking about um, academic outcomes in terms of grades? Uh, are we talking about an enjoyment of learning? Again, uh, a very noble statement, as noble as the first, um, but what is the school doing to realize this? And are they aware of what it is that they're communicating, that this is slightly different from grade outcomes that we may have seen in the first um, mission statement? And the last one here, very much talking about um, graduating college and, and being career ready. Again, obviously that does encompass uh, grades, that does it encompass attitude to learning, so on and so forth, but, but very, very different. So I want you to consider um, your current mission statement if you have one, uh, are you living up to that? If you don't have a mission statement, do you want one? Uh, is it something that you would publish um, or is it something that you would you would keep within your organization but know that everybody within the organization was working towards that um, so where do we start there is uh, an awful lot of research about engaging um, parents uh, I'll just put a few here there's something from education Scotland something from the Department of Education England there's something from uh, India in terms of involving families um, uh, and my experience is that an awful lot of this research is quite user friendly. Some research is, is you, you need a, a degree or two in statistics to be able to understand. Um, all of the research that I've come across is very user friendly. It's very practical. It, it, it gives you really good, solid ideas about what you can do. OK, but I would always start by, by considering what it is you do at the moment, whether you're doing it intentionally via a mission statement uh, or unintentionally. Uh, in terms of how you're engaging families and what's working what's what's not working so well how do you know that do you have any review uh, processes in place at the moment to, to gauge how successful your your kind of mission to engage families uh, is uh, have you looked into any uh, research and what are you doing uh, to engage stakeholders now with with any kind of uh, review or any kind of wholesale change or, or any kind of uh, new uh, initiative, I, I always start by talking to people. It might sound very basic and forgive me if that's patronizing, but, but talk to people. You'll find probably that some of your staff are parents. Um, and obviously talk to families, maybe set up working groups um, and, and try to target those families that are less involved and ask them what would be helpful, what is working well, what it is they kind of want from school. Some families just want to trust the school with their child's education uh, and pack them off, um, hope that they have a lovely day, hope that they learn uh, and then come away. Uh, other families want to be super involved, um, but as, as with many things, it's the, it's the group in the middle, um, I suppose, that we might want to be targeting, which tends to be the lion's share um, of our families, really. So um, whether it's at the beginning stage when you're going to, to uh, engage families to ask them their views, ask them what it is they want, or when you're up and running with some kind of system to engage families, how are you going to communicate with them? What's the most effective uh, way to communicate? Will it be through technology? Again, that's very much depending on your school, your organization. Will you communicate to families via the children somehow? Um, how much face to face? Uh, yes, we're living in COVID times and, and face to face isn't quite what it uh, was. Uh, but here we are in a kind of face to face. There's the virtual world and we will return, I'm sure, to a time where there can be uh, face to face. 
Um, but remember that, again, forgive me if it's patronizing, communication needs to be two ways. So you need to prove uh, and you need to embody the fact that you can listen uh, as much as you can talk. Okay. So again, there, there, are, there are certain things that need to be in place. There are, there are certain basics that families should expect uh, from you as a school. Um, and again, how you're going to communicate this will be considered. I will go into more detail in terms of what should, uh, what needs to be in place from a statutory point of view, I suppose, uh, and, and what might be extra, if you like. Uh, but you really do need to consider how to communicate. I'll, I'll talk briefly about Google Classroom, if nobody knows about that. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of the fact that a lot of people like face-to-face -face embodied there in that, that little picture. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to talk a little to some research that's out there about uh, text messaging. Uh, and, and obviously, we have the Internet that we're taking advantage of ourselves here today. Uh, so one piece of research, uh, and if you want to find this, if you, if you were to search the Education Endowment Foundation, that's the Education Endowment Foundation, you'll find this piece of research is relatively new. Uh, again, I won't read all of this to you, but it involved many, many thousands of students. Uh, and uh, it was about texting. Everybody carrying a phone. I've got my phone here. Uh, today it's working for me as a, as a countdown timer so that I don't overrun. But everybody carries a phone or the vast majority of people around the world carry phones with them and more and more uh, are doing so if they're not at the moment. Uh, and they set up a, a project where parents, families received weekly uh, text messages over the course of a year. And it could be about upcoming tests, it could be about homework, it could be just information about what the the children were learning at that point in the school year. <clears throat> and it seemed to make a considerable uh, difference. Okay. It seemed to make a considerable difference. I'm allowing you time there to read that. And it, it may be that you don't have the, the capacity to uh, engage parents this way. It may be that you're thinking, well, that wouldn't work for me because uh, I, I'm not in a school where uh, everybody carries a phone or it might be you're thinking, OK, yes, that sounds like a, a very sensible thing to be doing. And as I say, the Education Endowment Foundation uh, have a very good piece of research there. Um, you have a website, uh, hopefully. Um, and there's an awful lot of items that should be posted to your, your school or group uh, website. It might be information uh, that you need to put across uh, every term or every year about uh, curriculum overviews and and policies. And again, um, some of the things that need to be displayed on the website, certainly here in the UK and in many European countries, are statutory. They have to be there. So you need to consider what it is you have to communicate and then what it is that you might do um, as an extra, as it were. But it is a very, very good means of communication. But again, you need to be deciding when you're thinking about your mission statement, when you're thinking about what it is you want to do. How are you going to communicate? How are you going to engage with families? Will it be via text? Will it be via a website? Will it be face to face? I'm, I'm hoping that you're thinking, well, it might be a mixture of those things. And again, my experience shows that it should be a mixture of those things. Um, no matter where we are in the world, again, my, my experience shows me that people do appreciate face to face uh, contact. Even if it's virtual, they do appreciate face to face contact back that human touch. And obviously we've got email and there are still some families, some people that like hard copy mail, um, whether that is uh, a kind of a notice board that parents can engage with at the front of school or whether that is actual kind of hard copy that is sent out. But there you are, you, you've considered your mission statement, you've looked at some research, maybe that research has gone back to your mission statement, you've considered what it is that you uh, want to do, you consider how you're going to communicate this to families, whether it's going to be face to face, website text messaging or, or a mixture of, uh, of a number of different means. Um, Google Classroom. It's free at the moment. I'm sure it will be for a long time. I'm sure it will be forever. Hopefully it is a highly effective way to communicate. If you haven't used Google Classroom, uh, I suggest uh, if there's one takeaway from this session that you you uh, have a look at GAF, Google Apps for Education. Uh, a number of schools within our group are Google schools. Again, as I say, it's completely free. But Google Classroom is a really effective way to communicate to children in terms of uh, classwork and homework. But you can set up 
uh, student groups, you can set up family groups, you can add parents to student classrooms so that parents are seeing, literally seeing the work that students are being set, what they're doing, what their homework is. Uh, and it is an unbelievable resource. Uh, and as I say, it's uh, absolutely free. Now I talk about age appropriate communication. Um, again, forgive me if it's if it's patronizing. The messages that you might send to, to schools in your group or if you're in early years or a primary school uh, will be will be different from the messages that you'll send to secondary school or post 16 years um, families. In that families are, are more likely, your typical family is more likely to be able to help early years and primary uh, engage with education than than um, older children. You don't want to put families off uh, asking them to help uh, older children uh, with, with complex maths or, or a, a very deep uh, a kind of uh, theory in chemistry or physics that, that they can't do. You don't want to alienate parents by making them feel incapable of helping their uh, children. So as you get into secondary school age, kind of 11, 12, 13, 14 and, and above, the way you're communicating uh, be it website or, or email or text might be more factual. It might be about your your uh, the way you measure progress and how their children are doing. It might be about homework, um, so on and so forth, or upcoming tests, upcoming trips. As I say, um, you're going to put some families off if you uh, send them a message asking you to talk to your, their child about thermal decomposition. Uh, it can be too hard to access. I've actually worked in schools where, and, I, and I'll touch on this a bit later, we had to meet with some parents outside of school because the, t the parents themselves were school phobic. They had had uh, such a negative experience themselves of school that they, they couldn't come into school. Uh, if you were to send that, that kind of person uh, uh, that's already scared of school and, and feeling that school is not a safe place, uh, a very difficult question, a very difficult topic for them to discuss with their child, you're going to switch them off, you're going to put them off. And, and you don't want to be doing that. Okay, so what do you need to have in place? As, uh, as I say, um, many of these are statutory in certain countries. You, you know, you should display policies uh, around homework, around health and safety, around trips, around all kinds of things. Uh, there might be some guidance that's put up there, curriculum overviews. Again, um, there's no reason why you can't put those up with the caveat that they, they may change slightly, but it's nice if, if families know what's coming up for the next term or the next year in terms of books they might study, in terms of concepts they might be studying in different uh, subjects, uh, dates uh, for events. Very good to publish those uh, well ahead of time. Uh, home study, homework, whatever it is you're, you're calling home study. Uh, and again, on an individual basis, you, you, you may well be needing to, you may have an obligation to share uh, assessment outcomes. But also the, the kind of lighter, side of school uh, in terms of upcoming events, whether they're in school or, or publicizing events in the local area around sports, arts um, or culture. Now, what should we doing? Uh, what should we be doing that's above and beyond? OK, we run uh, head teacher Q&A's, head teacher question and answer sessions, family forums. Doesn't have to be just the head teacher. Uh, again, I'll touch on that a bit later. It could be that the head teacher might want to bring along the, the senior team. Um, it might mean that you you also run some parenting help sessions that are more about kind of uh, organization and the logistics around school. Uh, and it might be that you run very specific how to help with achievement sessions. And again, these could be run by the maths department, the English department, the science department, where you bring in families um, uh, and you help them with how they can help their child. It could be that you bring in uh, the whole family. So the child is sat there with a the parent uh, or it could be that you just bring in the families, the parents and, and the children stay away. We run an adult learn and train um, uh, uh, school uh, here in Cambridge, and we get an awful lot of people that come from overseas with very, very little English. And we have literally run evening classes uh, where the child, because the child's been able to pick up English much quicker, is sitting next to mum or dad and helping them with their study. And it's a really, really touching sight. Uh, and it's a, it's a very lovely, a very successful um, uh, school that we run there. OK. So uh, as I say, think about the way you're going to, to run your head teacher Q&As. There are times where we run, uh, it would literally be the head teacher and the senior team presenting to a, a room of two or 300 people. Other times we've, we've just asked for, for small round table groups um, to come along. 
It could take place once a, a term, they could be uh, yearly. As I say, they, these are, I tend to find are better face-to-face uh, -face and in school. Um, and if your head teacher or if you as a senior team are worried about uh, getting awkward questions or, or questions that could be difficult, ask for the questions to be sent in beforehand. Again, forgive me if patronizing, but it's a really, really good way of not only managing the kind of questions you're getting, but also being able to give a full and complete answer. You know, please share your questions beforehand. Uh, uh, and you'll find that there will be common themes, common questions, uh, but it does give you time to prepare a, a better and fuller answer. You'll also find that some uh, parents and parent forums want to ask very uh, specific questions specific to their child, and that's not the correct forum. So you're able to kind of pick those up um, beforehand, as it were. Okay, parenting help sessions, very, very good. Uh, as I say, um, it could be that it's about uh, organization, about the, ling um, the lo logistics, not linguistics, forgive me, the logistics around school. It could be that it's very specific to uh, subject, okay? Uh, be cautious, I won't say careful, be cautious about promoting direct parental assistance. We have to be very careful here in Cambridge that we don't find that a, a 12 or 13 year old uh, is writing a, a, an English uh, project, writing a story, and it just so happens that mum or dad is a is a doctor or a professor of English, and they produce something of Joycean standard uh, that isn't necessarily the uh, the child's own work. So just be careful with that. Assist in terms of organisation, in terms of you know, are you are you studying uh, without music and all that kind of stuff? Have you cleared a space in your room or or, or in the house? Um, but but be cautious promoting direct parental uh, assistance. I would publish the curriculum at the start of the year, as I've already said. Um, so that families know the topics that are to come. Um, I would provide support material. We do provide support material to families that are in need, uh, whether that's textbooks, um, uh, you know, whatever it is that families need. Um, and I would uh, consider uh, publishing potential summer reading programs so that there's some prep um, before they come back uh, for, the, for the autumn uh, term. Now, sometimes, uh, there's more intensive support needed. Many schools, many schools in the UK, in, in uh, parts of the UK, run breakfast clubs. Now they're doing that uh, from a health point of view. They're doing that because, because sadly, often that might be the one uh, kind of reliable meal that the, the children are getting every day. Um, <clears throat> but it's also it's also a very good way of fostering community. Um, it may be uh, depending on where you are. That, that parents are invited. Uh, and again, sadly, it might be that, that you're in an area and we have areas in the UK that are like this where that's the only kind of, uh, kind of reliable uh, meal that families uh, are getting as well. But, but breakfast clubs can be a, a very wonderful thing. They can be a place where uh, having eaten some breakfast, people are then able to um, uh, be helped with their work. It might be that teachers come along and, and you can see in the background of that slide there, teachers kind of helping students with some work as well as sharing that social time. Obviously, we're not just here to produce academic uh, outcomes for children. We're, we're here to educate them in terms of, you know, socialization and, and how they are um, out in the world. Um, home visits, it, it may be that you offer uh, home visits. Often when we do so, it's more for the younger children uh, and it's more uh, in terms of getting the, the child through the door because they're a little school phobic. But there are times where we have in the past we had a, a child that was very ill and, and leading up to exams, we sent tutors in to help with the exams and then we allowed uh, the, the, the child to sit their exams at home. Very specific uh, need, but it was something that, that was kind of encompassed in our mission statement about, you know, looking after everybody's needs all of the time, so on and so forth. So it was something that we could do and we felt we should do and we did. So home visits are something you might want to consider or it might be something that you think is very much off the table, but again, Consider this before you start, uh, in case you're asked a question at some point um, and you have to go away and think, oh, is, is home visit something we would do? We haven't really thought about that, you know, so as much kind of groundwork as you can at the beginning. Now, um, again, I don't know where you are in the world, but where we are in the UK, there's, there's more and more uh, kind of pressure on, on uh, producing grade outcomes, uh, in terms of different data sets. Uh, and we have over the years um, confused parents. Uh, education is, is full of kind of uh, jargon that 
us uh, teachers understand that families don't necessarily. So we've run workshops on how to understand data and how to understand reporting, because because sometimes it's just uh, beyond families to understand. You know, is a is is a is nine the top grade? Is one the top grade? You know, how well is my child doing? Uh, so that might be something that you consider, so that everybody can understand the data and the reports that are being shared. As I say, uh, certain workshops on certain topics can be run. They might be run by um, uh, departments, maths department, science department, so on and so forth. Um, it might be that you you set these up virtually, and if you set them up virtually, you might only need to run them once because you can record them. You know, learn from the from the world that we're in at the moment, record them, and put those on the website for people to access uh, whenever they want. As I say, and I'm I'm not here to promote Google Classroom, but I know it sounds as though it might sound as though I am. Google Classroom really is a free and fantastic way to engage families, whether it's through a parent group or whether it's through just attaching parents to the um, group that their child is in, in terms of the work that's being set and in terms of the homework. And homework menus, rather than setting um, a very hard and fast fixed piece of homework, uh, we've come to the point where we share menus, where there's seven or eight different topics at the start of the term that might be project work, uh, and it, it, it allows for greater kind of choice and the child picks one of the topics to work on over the term. <clears throat> uh, in terms of homework that you're sharing with families, you know, uh, again, forgive me if patronising that the task should be linked closely to the main teaching task. Homework should never be just a, a kind of extra that's bolted on. So, so it deserves timely and specific feedback. Um, Parents need to be encouraged to, to help children in terms of when and how they're going to do that homework, getting into a routine. You know, what are those good study habits? And it might be that you need to educate the families about good study habits so they can pass that on to the children. Uh, and as I say, it's about parents showing an interest and, and encouraging their child rather than specifically helping them in the actual task. We do not want parents um, writing the work for the children. <clears throat> now, um, as I as I draw to a close, um, and I don't want to be negative, at the start of any project, I always think about what are the barriers? What are, what are the barriers that you might have in terms of working with parents and how might you respond to those? I often think if you can uh, preempt uh, those barriers beforehand, you close many of them down, uh, but also have an answer because there'll be some barriers that you just can't close down at first, that it is going to take time. If you've got families that are a bit school phobic, it's going to take time and energy to change their kind of view uh, on school. OK, so, so, so be, be thinking about what those barriers might be and thinking about how you might be able to close those down. Um, always, always build in a review stage. Uh, how are you going to uh, measure the effectiveness of this new strategy that you put in place? Or if you're about to alter the strategy you have, how are you going to measure the effectiveness of that? Um, it, it's not easy, um, but there are ways. It could be that you form a, a, a working party uh, where you gather together some of the families. And it might be that you share that right at the beginning. It might say, hey, I'd like you to be, it might be that you say, hey, I'd like you to be part of a working party. And I'm going to try lots of different things this term, this year. And at the end of it or at regular points, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to ask your views and your opinion. It might be that at the end of those uh, those roundtable meetings or those head teacher Q and A's or the department sessions that you do a kind of roundtable review where you ask everyone or a few people to uh, to give uh, some feedback about what went well and how it could have been better or different. Um, and it may be that you do that through questionnaires and surveys. And it may be that you want to pick some of the students uh, and look at some of the data if you want to a harder measure. And that might be that you're going to uh, look at attendance and whether attendance grows because you're going to focus on improving attendance or just uh, improving the fact that school is a good place to come to and hope that attendance uh, increases or it might be that you look at grade scores because that's what you are after but as I say it goes right back to your mission statement really consider what it is you want to do are you looking to engage families because you you want to improve academic outcomes do you want school to be seen as a a real part of the community. What is it that you want to do? And that's where you should start. And as I say, with that constant kind of feedback loop so that you can review, are we doing what it is that we want to do? Um, thank you uh, for listening to me. I believe we're going into uh, a potential Q&A session now and I will stop talking and hand back um,
to the team. Thank you. How can we stop parents actually interfering too much in the work? So criticizing perhaps the teaching or the approaches. Now I I can kind of say from my perspective, helping my children with their work, the way things are taught has changed from when I was at school. Um, and it's a very, it's quite difficult sometimes as a parent to understand why things are being taught differently to the way that you're used to. Do you have any kind of insight on that at all? Um, yes, first of all, I'll just apologize for my own look because uh, in COVID lockdown, uh, barbers and, and beard trimmers are closed. So I, you know, I look a bit scruffy, forgive me. Um, in some ways, if you think back to the slide where I said, you know, you've got to prove that you are willing to listen as much as talk. Uh, in some ways, um, you, you don't necessarily want to shut that down. You do, you know, it is about engaging. It is about sharing beforehand. So, you know, uh, if, if you're aware of the fact that you're teaching something differently now to how it may have been taught in the past, maybe that's a time to, to set up a forum and invite people in and explain that beforehand, you know, preempt uh, any negatives that you might get at the end. You know, I know when you were at school, you may have been taught this way, but this is how we do it now and the reasons before. I, I can remember when I was in the classroom a lot more, I used to, uh, if I was trying anything new, I used to explain what I was going to try to the students. Now I did that as much for me as for them, because I, I thought to myself, if I, if I can't explain why I'm doing it, should I really be doing it? Have I just picked up some new fact? And that might be good for you as a school, you know, um, it might be a mechanism for you to stop and think, well, why are we doing it in this new way? And if you're absolutely convicted and it's good, then explain that to the parents and engage. You know, you're not always going to get positive uh, open arms feedback, uh, but listen and talk, uh, you know, and use it as an opportunity to, to educate, but also to bring people around to, to your point of view. There's no simple answer, but, you know, you're, you're going to get feedback. Um, listen to it and engage with it positively. Excellent, thank you. Um, and then we've also got a question here. Um, I know you've mentioned Google Classroom is a really useful tool um, and it's something that, that my children's school use as well. Are there any other family friendly kind of platforms that schools could look at other than Google Classroom? Well, there, we do. Yes, we have. Um, again, it's, it's literally, you know, one of the schools in our group uh, are, are very much about Microsoft uh, and, and the, the products are absolutely fantastic. Um, why did we choose Google? I just, in my own very humble and personal opinion, I find Google to be uh, simpler. Um, it's quite intuitive. Um, uh, essentially, they sold Google apps uh, for education as, you know, they, they, there was Microsoft Word uh, and they, they made it into a simpler um, uh, platform. So they took away, they, they were essentially saying that Microsoft was, was very much about business and it had that fantastic uh, capabilities that it had but it wasn't necessarily needed in the classroom uh, but we have great success with with uh, Microsoft products in our uh, science institution uh, I just find Google to be very intuitive we also found that Chromebooks were kind of super cheap as a as a as a tool that people could use um, so now I suppose it's very much about uh, personal preference I know that lots of organizations are, are, are developing um, various apps uh, now so it's, it's about what fits you I suppose Okay, thank you. We're also getting lots of, of um, questions and comments coming in about um, parents perhaps having unrealistic expectations of teachers responding instantly. So perhaps the parents, they're not engaging um, with material that's being sent out, but then they're, they're sending very specific questions or complaints or issues and then expecting an almost instantaneous response from the teacher. Do you have any suggestions on how to manage that? Yeah, so here in Cambridge, we're in the we're in the middle of uh, the world of unrealistic expectations. To be honest with you, um, and again, it's a it, go back to what I was saying about what you publish on the website uh, and policies or guidance. We have a very clear uh, policy document that says uh, the length of time we we will uh, reply to certain emails if it if it's something that's super urgent and a child is in danger. That might be that we will respond within X amount of hours. Uh, if it's a general request, we say you will receive an email within 48 hours. And we're very clear about that. We, we say that sometimes it might be that you just receive a holding email because the teacher is, isn't able to respond for a number of reasons, but you will get a holding email within, within 48 hours. Obviously, if you publish that, you've got, to, you've got to live by that. But I do think if you say to people you're going to get a reply within 48 or 72 hours, that that's perfectly reasonable. Um, you just need to make sure that you 
uh, you hold your teachers to that. Okay, I think, yeah, I think setting expectations is really important with parents there. Um, we've got a couple of questions coming in about um, what do you do if, if the child is perhaps being potentially dishonest in the, the communications that you're having with them, um, or if they're, it's a question around the child's behavior rather than their actual kind of work? Um, again, uh, it, it, being in being in COVID times where for the last year I've done virtually everything uh, face to face, it's really driven home to me uh, the need sometimes for face to face contact that you can't there, there's a nuance in a, in a there's there's something in a smile or a nod of a head that you just can't get in an email. Um, and and often uh, behavioral problems get are escalated because of, of poor communication via email. My advice there is if you can get families in. I, I, I've got to deal this week with an incident involving a dishonest child. I shan't go into detail, uh, but I, I instantly offered to the, to the family a, a, a face to face meet. And with COVID restrictions being, being lifted slightly here, we can do that. Uh, I think if it's about behavioral issues, it's best to get the family together. And if it is about a child being dishonest and not being completely clear, you know, make, you know, stick them in the room with, with mum and dad and, um, and take it from there, really. I just think I can remember when I first started teaching, I, I parents' evenings, consultation evenings, any kind of contact with parents, I, was, I thought was horrifying. Um, I thought I was always going to be, you know, told off. Um, but I've come to realise that actually decent, honest, face-to-face -face human conversation is, is absolutely fine. And the meeting might start in an awkward manner. It might be a little bit difficult, but you've got to work through that. Uh, and again, I don't want to be patronising, but, you, you know, growth comes from that and, and you actually end up with a closer uh, kind of relationship with the families. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that's true. It's certainly been my um, my experience. Um, so we're getting we're getting a lot of questions come through as we're talking. I'm just trying to keep an eye on the, the Q&A box here. Um, we've got quite a, a specific technical question here. Do we have any suggestions um, of any systems that will automatically notify parents if their child is absent from school, not participating in the class, not submitting the work as they should be? Yeah, so so um, Google <laughs> Google Classroom has a has a way of submitting. It has a way of of kind of chasing up. Uh, if you just enable the functions, as I say, if the parents are involved, uh, it can it can uh, ping a message to them as quickly as it can the child. You've got to be, be slightly cautious, again, depending on the country you're in. If they're over 16, you might need to ask permission to share information um, uh, about the child, because they're no longer a child, about the person with the family. But Google Classroom is uh, fantastic. I don't know whether this is a, a, a something that you can get in all countries around the world, but there's no, a, a system called Manage Back um, that will also help uh, in terms of attendance, in terms of things that are being submitted um, we have uh, parent mail, um, which we 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 are pinging messages out via um, text, uh, also by email, but but by by text. So there there are many. I don't know how many are global. I know that Google Classroom is global, uh, but I'm sure if you look, there are uh, some that do it. But I, honestly, I really can't. I do sound. I'm going to start sounding like a salesman for Google Classroom, it's a good job it's free <clears throat> because it is absolutely fantastic. The child submits, you can ping something back that says thank you, you can you can grade it, you can give the written feedback, you can give the grade back, you can rag it, you know, red, amber, green it, and that can go as quickly to the parent as it can to the student. Okay, thank you. Um, we're also getting quite a lot coming through in terms of what do we have, uh, what do we do if we've got parents who are perhaps um, either very nervous, just very passive, refuse to engage, do we have to accept sometimes that there are some groups of parents that you're not actually going to be able to get on board? Um, yes, yeah, sadly, I suppose we, we do have to. I don't find it easy to accept that. Uh, and I, 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 as I teach English now, but I, ca I came into teaching from engineering. So I have that kind of slightly, you can engineer a solution to anything kind of viewpoint. Uh, but I suppose, I don't know. Yes, I suppose we probably do need to accept that. I don't like the idea of that. I like to think there are ways, as I say, we used to, at one of the schools I worked in, we would meet parents in uh, local coffee shops. Um, 
uh, as a way of being able to engage with them. And we accepted the fact that we wouldn't get them into school, but we didn't accept the fact that we wouldn't engage with them. Um, I, I, I don't know. And, and I, again, I suppose, again, without being patronising, ask, is it as simple as saying to the families, you know, not, not why aren't you coming into school, but, you know, what can we do to, to help you engage? Could we meet somewhere else? You know, just, just um, I find it hard to give up. Uh, but I suppose, yeah, there will be, that's a sad reality of life, I suppose, that sometimes there'll be people that just won't engage. Yeah, it must be, it must be very difficult and frustrating from your perspective. Yeah, um, see, secretly, I haven't accepted that, but anyway. <laughs> I like that spirit, though. Um, Angeline has come in with a question here to, to say, have we got any suggestions for establishing rapport with parents online? Um, I know that that's obviously a lot harder than if you're seeing them face to face in the playground and things like that. Yeah, if you can, you know, in a, in a non-COVID world, um, at least start the year with something face-to-face. -face. Or if it's a new initiative, maybe at the launch stage, do it face-to-face. -face. Also consider putting it on twice uh, because there, there'll be some people that really, really want to engage. They just can't make that date, you know. Um, that, in terms of barriers, a lot of people have busy lives. Uh, it might be that you need to put things on during the vacation or even... Every now and again at weekends, you know, it's unpalatable in some ways, giving up your time, but you've got to. But yeah, I would always start with a face to face. That's your opportunity to build rapport for people in that, you know, in the first 30 seconds to think this is a, a good person. Um, I trust this this person with my child's education. And then you've, you've got that that you can build on through um, virtual. I think starting virtual, as I say, it's, it's just a bit difficult and there, you know there are so you can get off to a bad start so quickly yeah I think it's it's very difficult to um to kind of sometimes get across your point virtually isn't it um I think we've got time for just one last question um and this is coming in from Taiwo Taiwo thank you for your question it's how do you handle parents who are continuously doing their children's work rather than supporting them to do it um, again, you know, uh, honest and open dialogue, you know, ask them, explain why it's not necessarily a good thing. Hope that they change. Uh, if they if they they're not going to, then you're going to have to apply some kind of measure between, you know, uh, the, the reality of the, the grading will be somewhere between the, the work that's submitted done at home and in the classroom, you know. Um, but, you know, uh, as I say, just just ask just say look come on you know thank are you how much of this are you doing it's lovely that you are could you possibly slow pop find another way that they could help you know you don't want to kill off that keenness um but you know we just you know to end every year we do a we do a a, a project where children make a model of a volcano uh, and some of them look as though a 13 year old has made a volcano out of boxes and toilet rolls and some of them look as though their mum or dad is a professor of engineering at the university of cambridge uh, and it's got moving parts and, uh, you know, and, and, and fizzy pop kind of squirting at the top every two and a half minutes. You just have to apply adjustment, really. But you, you, you want to try to keep that enthusiasm, but just channel it in a different way. That's brilliant. I think that's a great point to end end the session. Um, Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us today and for, for sharing your your kind of thoughts and your suggestions. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined us around the world for your activity engagement for all of your questions I'm really sorry if we didn't get to your question um, just a quick reminder that we will be sharing recordings of this session and all of the sessions from the conference on our YouTube channel and you'll receive a link to that at the end of the week um, I'm going to leave it there for now if you're joining us again today I hope to see you again soon thank you again Jonathan bye-bye goodbye